Good evening. Thank you so much for coming. If you can, um, I'm going to stay within the 15 to 20 minutes that Gina and Kamozi prescribed. And, um, but I do want to just say some, some thank yous and, and maybe, um, for me, it's real special to be at the Schomburg, to, to give this presentation at the Schomburg. This is a very, very, very uh, special place uh, to me, I think to a lot of people. Um, I, I can remember very clearly coming here one day as a college student and just spending the entire day at the, in the microfilm room looking at newspapers. And it was then that I kind of said, this is a wonderful way to spend time. I'd love to do this for the rest of my life. And, um, you know, just being here was very, it was just very, very special to come to Harlem, to come to the Schomburg Center, uh, and to do serious research about uh, black people in America and around the world. Um, so it's really an honor to be here, and I'm very thankful to, to Dr. Muhammad, to the entire staff, to Dr. Uh, Dodson, um, who, who was here for, forever. Um, so thank you, and thank you for coming. I'm also very appreciative to Jean and Kamozi, who have been um, really important mentors, uh, friends um, for over a decade. Um, and as well as to an entire community of teachers and scholars, Clarence Taylor is one of them. Um, you know, 10, 12 years ago when I started wanting to do research on the civil rights movement in Brooklyn, New York, there was, there was nothing. There were no books, there were no articles, there was, there was nothing. <laughs> there was really, I mean, there were just people. Um, well, that's not true, there wasn't nothing. There was Clar Clarence Taylor's work was out there. Clarence, um, um, the Black Churches of Brooklyn um, uh, came out in 1994, I think, in the soft cover, and then Knocking at Our Own Door, a book about uh, uh, Reverend Glamison and the teacher strike of 1964, uh, that came out um, uh, in 1998, and then there was a reprint of it. So, I mean, there were some things. I shouldn't say there was nothing. Um, um, but it was, you know, very few. If you talked about wanting to do civil rights movement history in the North, people kind of looked at you funny, like, you know, there, there was a movement in the North. And so, you know, Gene and Kamozi have been doing this for well over a decade, and they've really uh, worked so hard to create not just an academic and an intellectual space, but also a politically serious space uh, in which to talk about these ideas and why they matter, not just in the past, but in the present. So. Um, very, very uh, fortunate to be here. Um, I'm going to speak a bit about my, my book, which is odd to call it that, but this is the, this is the only copy that the press had. I, I was begging them to try to send more, but I guess presses do what they do. Um, and the, the shipping date just kept getting pushed back. So uh, they said, well, we have one lying around in the office. And I said, well, why isn't it lying around in my office? <laughs> So they sent it, and I just got it yesterday, and I'm very happy to have it uh, hold it up. And um, uh, it's called Fighting Jim Crow in the County of Kings. I'm going to talk today about the book. Um, I'm just going to give an introduction as to kind of why I wrote it. Um, tell a little story about that. I'll give an overview of <clears throat> some of the ideas and the main kind of themes and arguments in the book. Let me put this on so we can look at it. How do I do that, though? Oh, view. Sorry, I'm a little low tech. That, that's, that's, uh, that's it, right? Yeah. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about some of the themes in the book, and then I'm just going to give one of the, I'm going to talk briefly about one of the chapters, um, a, a chapter on a protest against uh, infrequent garbage collection. So um, that's one of uh, a couple of um, um, campaigns that I talk about in the book. So uh, Fighting Jim Crow in the County of Kings, the Congress of Racial Equality in Brooklyn. This is a history of the early 1960s um, interracial, nonviolent, direct action protest civil rights movement in the North, right? Um, the scope of the book goes from about 1960 till about 1965, 1966. Um, and why I wrote this, there's kind of three, um, three reasons why I came to want to write this book. Um, it's an academic reason that's sandwiched in between two personal reasons. So personal reason number one, 
uh, that I wrote this book is I grew up in I grew up in Brooklyn and I grew up in New York in the 1980s and the 1990s. Uh, and if you are from New York City or you know about New York City in the 80s and the 1990s, and this where I lived in Brooklyn um, in the Coney Island, the border of Coney Island and Brighton Beach, it was an incredibly racially segregated place. It was incredibly racially segregated, and that was just something that I was very, very conscious of my entire life, right, was how segregated by race and ethnicity and religion and class New York City was. Um, but also in the 80s and the 90s, there was a lot of tension in New York City and in Brooklyn in particular. You know, um, um, uh, Howard Beach happens in, when I, you know, in 1986. Yousef Hawkins is murdered uh, in Bensonhurst. Uh, Crown Heights blows up uh, in the early 90s. You know, I mean, there was a lot of, you know, there was a lot of electricity in the air in New York City back then. Um, so I was very, very interested my entire life as to why and how this was the case. Like, why and how is this normal, right? Um, so that's kind of the personal reason that I wanted to investigate the history of racism in New York City. An academic reason was that when I went to college and went to African American studies, I found that there was a lot of evidence that there was activism uh, in, the, in the civil rights movement in New York. I mean, I just started looking through newspapers, really. I just would go through newspaper reels of 1963, and I just found article after article after article about demonstrations right here, right across the street. The first thing that I wrote about was demonstrations to desegregate jobs on the construction site of Harlem Hospital in the summer of 1963. Right? And it just went on and on and on. And so many people were talking about this. And I just kind of had one of these moments where it's like, how come we don't know about this? Right? If it's happening so much and so many people are talking about it, how come we don't know about this? And one of the main organizations that did those demonstrations in the summer of 1963 was the Congress of Racial Equality. So as I started to look into CORE, and learn more about it. I knew about the Freedom Rides. That's usually what we hear when we talk about CORE. Um, I saw that this chapter in Brooklyn was doing everything. <laughs> they were doing, and it was almost like they were doing everything all at once. They were fighting against housing discrimination. They were fighting against discrimination in racially segregated unions. They were fighting for uh, public education desegregation. They were fighting uh, to increase sanitation collection uh, in North Central Brooklyn, in Bedford-Stuyvesant in particular. Um, they planned this audacious event to try to shut down the city on the opening day of the World's Fair. I mean, they were just all over the place from 1961 till about 1965. If, if something happened concerning civil rights in Brooklyn or in New York City, Brooklyn Corps was involved, right? So that's kind of how I grab it. So those are kind of the academic um, reasons that m allowed me to investigate this personal interest. And then the other, the third reason that I, um, that I investigated this book and really decided to write it was because of how much enthusiasm and trust I received from uh, the activists who lived it. Um, it's really, really, um, it's, it's really humbling and amazing um, how I just picked up the phone one day when I told my professor, I said, I really want to write about Brooklyn Cord. What should I do? He said, well, you got to interview people. Who should I interview? He said, I don't know, but <laughs> he said, call, call G2 Way you see, he'll know. And I said, okay, <laughs> I'll call G2 I didn't, I didn't know who G2 Way you see was. Thankfully, he was listed. <laughs> you know, he looked him up in the phone book. His phone number was right there. I called him up. I said, this is who I am. This is where I'm coming from. This is what I'd like to do. And he said, come down. He was a vice principal at the time uh, in Brooklyn. And we just talked. We talked, you know, in his office while he was like reprimanding a little kid or something or telling him to, you know, not get in trouble the next day. He then turns to me and starts, he's like, well, what do you want to know? Right? And we just talked for like an hour. <laughs> and then he's like, well, now you got to call this person and this person. He gave me two phone numbers. Right? And then those two people, one invited me over to eat at her house, and there were four other people in the, in the house right there. And we just talked for like four hours. Right? And on and on and on and on, and on it went until I interviewed about a good 45 people. Right? All over the country. You know, Ithaca, New York, San Francisco, Kannapolis, North Carolina. 
right? It was, and, and there was just a tremendous amount of love. I, I mean, that's the only way I could put it, right? And trust. One guy once, uh, his name is Um Samaji Weusi. He's passed. He was a postal worker for his entire life. He had an entire collection of this newspaper called Black News, right, which ran out of Brooklyn in the late 60s through the 80s. And I was just amazed that he had an entire run of this. And I, he's, he's like, oh, do you want to borrow it? I said, I can't take this out your house. You know, I was like, you'll really let me take this out your house? He's like, if I don't trust you, then who can I trust? <laughs> it's like, whoa, okay, right? So I, that's kind of the third reason that I, I, I wrote this book. Um, there was a lot of, and again, these are people who, some of them hadn't spoken for years. They're people who had political and personal disputes, but all of them were very interested and invested in participating in getting a history of what they did down. Now, you know, they may not agree with everything that I wrote. In fact, I know that they don't, and, but they've also been extremely generous that they gave me the freedom uh, to do the work that I do as a historian. So um, it was a really humbling and, and awesome experience. And then I guess, you know, there is kind of, I guess, three and a half is, is a political reason um, that I was interested in this history and in this book, which to simply put, I think that, you know, New York City, um, Racism and segregation and inequality have gotten worse over the decades, not better. Um, so ultimately, I, want, I hope this book is a conversation starter about, well, what can we learn from this activism and think about how it could apply to today. So there's just a few things that I'll say about the arguments in the book. I'll take about 10 more minutes. Is that OK? Yeah, all right. Um, one is that when we think about Brooklyn, we think about a lot of things. When we think about Brooklyn and when we think about civil rights and if we think about African Americans in Brooklyn and civil rights types politics, there's two things that come to mind immediately. There's two things that kind of put Brooklyn on a national map and one of them um, is, is, is Jackie, Jack uh, uh, Roosevelt Robinson who um, integrates uh, Major League Baseball in 1947. Um, and he plays for the Brooklyn Dodgers. I haven't seen the movie yet. I hear it's not that great, um, but, it, but it's okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna check it out. I mean, you know, one of the things when I looked into Robinson I, and, and when, he joined, when he went to play for the Dodgers, I wasn't interested in, when I started researching him, for, I wasn't really that interested in what happened on the ball field or if somebody spiked him. Well, I, didn't, I mean, I wanted to know where he lived. <laughs> <laughs> because that's again, that's kind of what um, is happening so much in Brooklyn from the 20s onward, right? It's it's housing segregation against black people, right? I wanted to know where Robinson lived, and and he, there's this real odyssey that Robinson experiences trying to find housing, um, not just in Brooklyn, and then not just in Queens, like all over the place. So he has to he has to like buy land upstate and build his own house. Um, but when he first moves to Brooklyn, he lives where other black people live, which is in a crowded, um, um, you know, uh, uh, flat in a tenement that's, you know, has roaches and, and vermin. And he's just like, we got to get out of here. But that's, that's the first housing that's available to him in 1947 in Brooklyn. So when we civil rights in Brooklyn, we might gravitate on the early side of it to, to Robinson and integration of Major League Baseball or We'll think about Shirley Chisholm, who's the first, the first uh, African American uh, congressional representative for a predominantly black section of Brooklyn. The 12th congressional district is created in 1966 after local struggle, right? And it creates this congressional seat for an area in Brooklyn that has well over 350,000 people, right? But for decades had been gerrymandered to support local white Democratic um, um, elected officials, right? And black people had no representative for their area, right? So it's not until 66 and then she wins in 68 and then she runs for president in 72, right? But she's, she's Brooklyn, right? I mean, she's West Indian, um, Barbadian in particular. My mother wants me to say that. Um, <laughs> St. Michael's Parish. <laughs> You know, she's, she's Brooklyn and she is this, she is, becomes a national kind of um, uh, symbol and representative of activism and black politics in Brooklyn. So those are two things that we think about. There's, there are others, um, but those are two. And um, I wanted to know about this 
civil rights activism in the North that looked a lot like what was happening in the South at the same time, but it was very different issues, right? So in this early 1960s period, the Eyes on the Prize story is about nonviolent direct action protests, right? At lunch counters, um, um, to integrate public space, right? That's kind of the story that we hear about civil rights in the early 60s. I wanted to investigate that same type of activism in the North, so that brought me to CORE. CORE was decidedly interracial. That was part of its philosophy. It was nonviolent. Their protest tactics are based on Gandhi, Gandhi's principles of satigraha, right? Kind of soul force in transforming racists and bigots and oppressors. So we could talk about that if you're interested in it. But that's, that's what they did in, or all around the country, in Brooklyn and other cities. Um, so I, 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 I turn my research and my attention to this group um, and to its, its the, the types of campaigns that it led. One of its first major issues has to do with, with housing. Um, I think it's, uh, um, um, I'm not, I'm not going to get the quote right, so I'm not going to try to say it. But um, one of the scholars of African Americans in Brooklyn called um, housing discrimination in Brooklyn, quote, the initial stride of domination, right? A lot of problems, a lot of racism in uh, a place like Brooklyn stems from the inability of incredibly large populations of black people to live outside of a restricted area, right? So um, these are just some uh, numerical statistics about demographics, uh, racial, uh, white, black specifically demographics in Brooklyn from 1940 to 1980. The long and the short of these numbers are, as time goes on, Brooklyn gets uh, uh, less white, it gets blacker. Um, and in particular, the numbers are pretty staggering. By 1970, there's over 650,000 black people in Brooklyn. And what's, what's important to note is that almost, almost all, not all, but almost all of these you know, 300,000 in 1960, 650,000 in 1970, almost all um, black people in Brooklyn live in north central Brooklyn, those areas that are highlighted on this map, right? Which people, um, begin more and more and more and more throughout the post-World War II period to call Bedford-Stuyvesant, right? Bedford-Stuyvesant is a 95% black community in North Central Brooklyn. It's a fascinating place. Uh, it's, it's very rich in class diversity, in ethnic diversity. There's African Americans from the South. There are African Americans from Harlem. There are black people from the English-speaking Caribbean. There are Spanish-speaking people of African descent from Puerto Rico and Cuba and the Dominican Republic. It's this awesomely vibrant, complicated place, right? Um, but from the outside, it's the black ghetto in Brooklyn, right? That's what it is from the outside, right? And in some respects, the way that certain people have to live in it because of poverty and circumscription through residential segregation and overcrowded, underfunded schools, et cetera, it does mirror characteristics of a ghetto, right, that limits people's social mobility and their economic and social opportunity. Not for everybody who's there, but for a lot of people who are there. Right? So it's important to keep that in mind. That's what Brooklyn Core, that's what they saw, that's what they heard, and that's what they addressed. And the one um, story that I'll tell has to do with garbage. And the garbage case illustrates some of the main arguments in the book. Namely, one, that in a place like Brooklyn, um, activists had to make what seemed to be, or what people claimed was, invisible. Right? They had to make the invisible visible. Right? So in a place like Brooklyn, in a liberal place like New York City, right? Housing segregation isn't a function of racism, right? There's no red-faced, pot-bellied southern sheriff saying, you know, you can't live here, right? That's not, there's no whites-only fountains and whites-only rest signs on restaurants. That's not on Flatbush Avenue, right? But there is this very palpable and real segregation that exists. So where does it come from? So one of the arguments is that, well, you know, this is, it's, it's not really seen, it's covert, it's hidden, it's invisible, it's subtle. 
It's an accident of choice. Of course all black people would want to live in North Central Brooklyn. Like, people just want to live next to other people like them, except when they don't, right? Uh, except when they want to move because their money can enable them to move, or except when they just want, a, they need more space, right? So there's this argument about discrimination in a place like Brooklyn that it's invisible, that it's hidden, right? That it's an accident. So Brooklyn Core, one of their missions in their campaigns was not only to bring about a political change, right? It wasn't only to win jobs or win housing or desegregate schools. It was also to make this seemingly invisible reality visible. Right? I mean, that's what their demonstrations are doing. They're taking a problem and they're making it public. And they're saying that this is not hidden. It's very real. You're just not seeing it. Right? Another aspect of what happens when this seemingly invisible social practice metastasizes is that people themselves who live in these conditions are blamed for them. Right? So the reason that in the case that I'll talk about briefly, the reason that Bedford-Stuyvesant is dirty and filled with trash is because the people who live there don't know how to take care of their neighborhood, right? They are dirty, right? That's just the way those people are, fill in the blank. Or as people would say in Brooklyn, they, where they eat, right? I'm not gonna, you know. There's, there's all these ways that people make cultural and behavioral arguments, right? For what is explicitly social phenomenon. So Brooklyn Core has to take these cultural arguments and make them political. So that's kind of the two things that they do with their protests. Now, in, in, for the most part throughout the book, if, if, you, if you read it, they have mixed success. And we could talk about why. Um, the, the garbage case, though, is an interesting one um, because they actually have a temporary uh, victory that I found by doing some research. Let me just talk about this, and then I'll um, uh, see the, the podium. Um, these high levels of concentrations of people in places like Bedford-Stuyvesant, which has a pretty old and increasingly degenerative housing stock, right? And there's reasons for that, right? Because there's so many people that can't live elsewhere because of housing segregation. They're forced to double and triple and quadruple up in these limestones and brownstones, right? And over time, right, those, those, that housing stock deteriorates as this um, photograph on, on Gates Avenue illustrates. Um, another condition of such high population density is an excessive amount of trash, right? Just everywhere, right? Here's an interesting photograph from 1962 of a typical kind of alleyway along Gates Avenue in Bedford-Stuyvesant, which is just filled with mattresses and turned over garbage cans and chairs and household garbage of various nature. Here's a scene of a, of a core member who's going throughout the neighborhood uh, taking polling data and there's a scene of the types of litter that exists outside um, of the of, of where they live. So there's just trash everywhere and it stinks and it's attracting vermin and kids are getting bit by rats and it's just a really, really difficult place for people to live. So Brooklyn Core initiates uh, conversations with the department. Well, first, they try to go through political channels with the borough president and the borough president says, I can't do anything about sanitation collection. You need to go talk to the mayor's office. The mayor's office says, we can't do anything about Sanitation collection, you need to go to the city council. They're the ones that control the budgets. Brooklyn Corps goes to the city council. They say, we can't do anything about sanitation collection. You need to go to the Department of Sanitation, Department of Sanitation, and on and on and on and on and on, right? So there's this very vigorous investigative campaign. They do comparative analysis with another area of Brooklyn, which has half the population density, but gets the same sanitation collection and is the reverse image of Bedford-Stuyvesant's racial demography. Bedford-Stuyvesant's 95% black, so they're kind of integrated because Marine Park is 99.9% .9 white. Are you telling me to hurry up? Sorry, I got a little carried away. Five more minutes, I'm sorry. They do comparative research and they say, this is because of the race and the class of the people in Bedford-Stuyvesant. So the only way, again, to make this seemingly invisible problem visible is they go throughout the neighborhood, they pick up the trash, they load it onto a U-Haul truck, 
And again, part of the reason they do this is to create a public kind of spectacle around the problem and to attract people in the neighborhood to the organization and to the cause. Um, one of the members, a man named Bob Law, who had a radio show uh, for a while, um, he called it, when he participated, he, said like, he felt like he was participating in a parade. They drive the trash down to Borough Hall in downtown Brooklyn, which is the seat of uh, uh, the, mayor, the borough president's office, and they dump it in front of Borough Hall, and they parade, um, and they demand for uh, increased sanitation collection. Show us integration with better sanitation is one of the placards. Um, that they held, which I think is interesting because it shows, again, what integration means in a place like Brooklyn, right? It's not about sitting next to someone in a cafe or a restaurant. It's not even necessarily about being able to sit next to somebody uh, in a school, although that is a big part of the school desegregation plan. Sometimes integration, or, or a lot of times in the civil rights movement integration, in Brooklyn, the civil rights uh, integration means better, e equal, equal resources, right? Equal services from the city. Um, jobs, right? Um, jobs that are funded with public money, what, they, what later on people would call affirmative action. Those are the issues that activists in the North um, fight for. So what's really interesting about, you know, um, this is a picture of one of the Brooklyn Corps activists. She gets a $5 ticket, which she refuses to pay, and she says she'd rather go to jail than pay the $5 summons. Um, the protest kind of does its damage in the press uh, and then it wanes over time. And I was really curious as to see what happened with this because garbage becomes another issue, an issue again in 1967 in East Harlem and in Brownsville where people have what they're calling garbage offenses and they're continuing to raise questions about excessive trash. But I did some research in the Department of Sanitation Records. It was really interesting through compiling their own kind of statistical reports from 1960 to 1964. Bedford-Stuyvesant actually does experience an increase in the tonnage of waste that's removed and in the man hours worked on bulk refuse uh, removal. Now, I can't prove that that happened because of Brooklyn Core, but it, it does happen, right? I mean, they're raising awareness about these issues that people would otherwise ignore, and they're doing it in a citywide way, right? And when their demonstrations are clear and direct and powerful and dramatic, they're able to gain attention from newspapers and the mayor and power brokers, et cetera, and they're able to get the message out. And we could talk a bit more about what they do or what they don't do in their other campaigns. So thank you so much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Brian. That was uh, a terrific, and congratulations on a wonderful book. Uh, I also I would like to thank uh, Jean Nicomosi for uh, inviting me and organizing this um, uh, discussion. Uh, I do have, um, I guess, uh, a, a more of a focus on. Uh, an earlier civil rights struggle in uh, New York City. And one of the books uh, that I uh, published in uh, 2011 and had to deal with, deals with the New York City Teachers Union. I, I don't think there's anyone here who would disagree with me uh, when looking at the state of education in New York City today once it would one will not argue that there is a crisis uh, when we look at the Bloomberg legacy uh, and, and, and there are clearly many aspects of his administration we can uh, criticize but I think the, the two most outstanding points aspects are in policing looking at stop and frisk and of course is educational policy. The closing of over a hundred schools since he has gained mayoral control of the New York City school system. The increasing number of charter schools, some of them even placed in uh, buildings where we have public schools taking, uh, existing. Uh, and this all under the guise of educational reform. And the question is, how did we get to this point? 
Uh, and there are some who argue that, well, it's because of this, these new brand of folks who call themselves uh, educational reformers, you know, going back to the 1990s, uh, criticizing in particular teachers uh, and teacher unions. Well, <clears throat> my argument is, well, yeah, no doubt one can point their finger at these people in the 1990s, but uh, they didn't get there in the 1990s just out of uh, out of nowhere. They didn't just drop out out of space and land here and start arguing for educational reform. This is a long history. Uh, and that history began back in the early part of the 20th century when there is a major struggle over education. And in particular, what type of unionism was going to dominate in this city and in the nation. There was one brand of educational unionism or a, a teacher unionism that advocated this professional unionism, you know, a unionism that worked for the betterment of teachers, improving their working conditions, improving their salaries, a, a sort of militant type of unionism, while another type of unionism wanted to make it a lot broader in their definition uh, of unionism. And so early on in the, the first uh, union, teachers union established in New York City, uh, 1960, uh, the New York City Teachers Union, this is not the United Federation of Teachers, uh, I always want to make that clear. Uh, 1960, there's something called the TU, the Teachers Union, and the Social Democrats, the ones who stressed professionalism, wanted to improve the working conditions for our teachers, and who also advocated you know, uh, professional teacher training, and those are the folks who sort of dominated the union. But there was this insurgency of, of unionists, well, many of them who belonged to the American Communist Party, who had a much broader definition of unionism, as I noted. And for them, they connected unionism to the communities in which, in which they worked. They also talked about the connection between their type of unionism, white collar unionism, and industrial unionism. But these communists managed to convince many teachers who were coming into the system that you know their type of unionism was on the right track. And so by 1935, there is this major split in the teachers union, the largest union in teachers union in New York City by 1935, because by 1935, you have other unions being formed. Uh, and some 700 of those members of the TU walk out and form a rival union called the Teachers Guild, leaving the TU to the communist. And these communists are quite active in, in, in pushing their type of unionism, this broad type of unionism. So what emerges by 1935 is a union that creates a civil rights plank, it, 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 it still, it's a civil rights agenda. And that civil rights agenda is quite clear. They want to eradic, uh, eliminate racist textbooks from the New York City school system. And I should note that some of those textbooks were still in existence when I was school, in, in public school in the 1960s. Uh, textbooks that condone slavery, uh, portray slavery as benign institution. 
uh, noting that uh, Reconstruction was a tragic era in American history, noting that immigrants in particular from Africa, from Latin America, were culturally inferior. Uh, these were the types of texts. A little black sambo in the 1960s was still being used in the New York City public school system, approved by the Board of Examiners. Now, it's this type, these types of textbooks that the New York City Teachers Union argues are simply not, to, I mean, it should not be in the New York City school system because they denigrate uh, black and Latino children and immigrants. It is this union that pushes for the hiring of more black and Latino teachers by 19, late 1940s, it's the union that's going into the schools and taking surveys on the professional staff, looking at the racial makeup, not the New York City Board of Education. New York City Board of Education said, we don't keep those records. It's, it's the union, because it's important that we know who's working. And what do they uncover? That, that two and a half percent of uh, the teaching staff in New York City with regular licenses uh, uh, are black and Latino. And when you include substitutes, you move it up to a little over 4%. So we need to address this problem. Why is it important to democratize the New York City school system? It's important that not only black children, but black and Latino children, but also white children see black professionals in the classroom. And so the union has to make the argument for, uh, and not just make the argument, launch a campaign to force the New York City Board of Education to hire more black and Latino teachers. It's the New York City Teachers Union that pushes for the teaching of black history in the public school system. Not only they, they say it's, it's, it's incorrect to have those textbooks, but we need to also remedy this by letting folks know and challenging the racist narrative of American history. So they make up kits and they pass them on, on black history, on looking at certain aspects of black history going from the American Revolution to Reconstruction to World War II, uh, noting the role that African Americans played in shaping the American experience. And so it's, it's this, and this union that also decides by 1935 to go into the communities, in particular in Harlem and in Bed-Stuy, to work with activists and parents uh, for important educational reforms, you know, including building, getting the New York City Board of Education to build new buildings in those areas. Harlem and Bed-Stuy had the oldest school buildings in the city, some of them over 100 years old. It was, those those uh, buildings were overcrowded. Some of them should have been condemned. It's, but it's the parents working along with the Harlem Committee and in Brooklyn, the, uh, the uh, Bed-Stuy and Williamsburg uh, School Council that pushed for the building of new schools in those communities. In addition, they also challenge the board's zoning pro uh, policy noting that it's the New York City Board of Education that segregates children <laughs> through its zoning um, practices. And so, and they call for the, the school, uh, uh, board of, the New York City Board of Education to build schools where black, white, and Latino children can attend. And so it's this union that sort of carves out this sort of civil rights agenda, and it works diligently for it, working along with activists and parents uh, in those communities. And it's this, this type of unionism that comes under attack. 
1935, it is attacked by the, within the ranks of teacher unionism, the American Federation of Teachers. The minute the communists gain control, they are under attack. And by 1941, the AFT revokes the charter of Local 5. Local 5 then joins with the new Congress of Industrial Organizations in which many of those unions in the CIO uh, are dominated by communists or have communists on their executive boards. But by the late 1940s, when uh, the Cold War hits, uh, all these unions are under attack. And New York City Teachers Union uh, is under attack by a, 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 a communist, anti-communist network consisting of the New York City Board of Education, which leads the campaign along working with the New York City Police Department in his infamous Red Squad Bureau of Special Services. It works with the House on Un-American Activities Committee, uh, as well as the Hartley Committee, uh, as well as private civic groups to eradicate this union. So a whole host of people come, to, groups come together to eliminate the New York City Teachers Union. Over a thousand members of that union are called before uh, a, the Board of Education, the, either the Chancellor and then later his representative on the city corporation, a man by the name of Saul Moskov. And close to 400 teachers either fired, forced to resign, or forced to retire. Uh, none of those teachers, let me note here, none of those teachers were fired for being incompetent in the classroom. It is because of their political affiliation with the American Communist Party that they were dismissed. And 1950 is the most devastating year. By 1950, you have something known as the Timon Resolution that was passed. The Timon Resolution named after George Timon, a member of the New York City Board of Education, uh, heading its uh, legal committee, pushes this resolution banning the New York City Teachers Union from the school system. It could not collectively bargain, uh, could not represent teachers in grievances. It could not hold meetings in buildings. It was simply just banished and the resolution was passed. Now that union did not disappear after this devastating attack. It attempted to remake itself and in particular become a strong advocate in the area of civil rights, pushing those very issues that I noted, uh, fighting to increase the number of black and uh, Latino teachers in the school system, fighting to eliminate racist and biased textbooks, fighting for black history to be taught in the schools. But by 1960, the, the, the writing was on the wall. There was a, a election held uh, for collective bargaining rights, sole collective bargaining rights, and this union that had been banned some a decade from the schools really has no chance of winning this election. Instead, it is the Teachers Guild along with a branch of the high school social studies um, uh, teachers union that come together and they form something called the United Federation of Teachers that wins sole co collective bargaining rights. And the union hangs on for another four years, uh, and then it decides to disband. Now, its brand, it's, it's not just the fact that this union disappears, its brand of unionism disappears. And instead, what we get is a union that is militantly fighting for collective, uh, 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 fighting for benefits, is fighting for higher wages, uh, is what, 
fighting to improve the conditions of its members. Uh, and it does raise some issues, uh, social issues. You know, um, um, Richard Kallenberg in his biography of Albert Schenker argues in that book that Albert Schenker was a civil rights leader. By any stretch of the imagination, uh, to see Albert Schenker as a civil rights uh, activist is, you know, uh, far-fetched. But nevertheless, he, he makes that argument and, and he notes Schenker traveled south, he marched in Selma, and you know, he, he pushed for many uh, important civil rights legislation, and that's true, but I, I remember uh, a, a good friend of mine, uh, Martha Biondi, raising the question, someone who was making this arg argument, what did he do in New York City? Well, we had a civil rights struggle going on here. And that's an important question, because the union did not have the same outlook as the New York City Teachers Union. It didn't work in the communities like the New York City Teachers. It didn't develop that, that relationship. And so what we wind up having is this clash between black and Latino parents and the New York, uh, the, the United Federation of Teachers. And this was clear not in 1968, before 1960, in the 1950s when the Teachers Guild existed and the New York City Board of Education produced a, a, a commission on integration and made recommendations. And one of those recommendations had to deal with the teaching staff, that we take more experienced teachers and send them into predominantly black and Latino communities. The Teachers Guild objective, ob objective and their slogan was integration, yes, forced transfers, no. And they put pressure on the New York City Board of Education and New York City Board of Education backed away. And this infuriated parents. It was clear that parents were uh, uh, angry over the New York City, uh, the, uh, the Teachers Guild position. Um, and so we can go back and look at the 1950s and look at the position. 1964, when Milton Galamison and the NACP and Brooklyn Core and others were organizing what would become the largest civil rights demonstration in the nation. In 19, on February 3rd, 1964, when close to a half a million children were kept out of the New York City public schools in order to force the New York City Board of Education to come up with a plan and a timetable to integrate the schools. Where was the United Federation of Teachers on this position? Where were they in the strike? The Glamison went to Charlie Coogan the president of the United Federation of Teachers and asked for support, and he turned them down. Said, no, we will back any teacher who will cross the picket line, I mean, who will, go, who, who will stay out of school and, and um, support uh, that uh, boycott, but we, our position, official position, is that we are not supporting it. And so when 1968 takes place, it shouldn't be a surprise to anyone. Uh, and, and of course, 68 was one of the most devastating moments in the city's history. And I argue that this probably would not have taken place if we would have had another brand of teacher unionism. And so that, that's, that's where I, I end the book in 1964, uh, uh, and, and, and hopefully you know, people can start raising these questions about you know, how do we get to this point, because there is this division 